Hello everyone, um, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, webinar that might be a little bit different from our usual sessions, but one that we're really looking forward to presenting. My name is Chris Richards, I'm from the ACNC's education team. Um, today we're gonna to be looking at the pandemic's impact on the charity sector, but more specifically on the sector's people. Uh, and more importantly, we're gonna be discussing some useful and practical ways that charities can help their people uh, and, and meet the challenges that they might face. Um, so it's gonna be a bit people orientated uh, today and that's a good thing. Um, e and even better look, we've got some great people joining us today to share their expertise, their viewpoints uh, and their knowledge to help charities and, and charity people. Today's webinar is a joint effort uh, between the ACNC and the X Factor Collective uh, and joining us today are, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of a run through for each of our presenters today. Um, Leanne Hart, um, who's got uh, a bit of experience, a lot of experience in um, people leadership, in learning and development um, and workplace wellbeing. Uh, and is also involved in the sector as a volunteer board chair uh, at a not-for-profit. Uh, hi Leanne, how are you? Hi Chris, thanks for having me along. Thank you Leanne. Um, Joe Smythe um, is our other or our second presenter um, who works with uh, organisations to deliver uh, business strategy through uh, organisational culture, um, people experience, uh, fostering good leadership. Uh, Joe is also an experienced uh, board professional on a, on a not-for-profit. Hi Joe, how are you? Hi Chris, great to be here. Thank you. Um, and our third speaker or our third co-presenter today is Adam Blanche. Um, Adam is a psychologist uh, and he educates organisations and therapists um, in preventing and resolving both trauma and vicarious trauma. Uh, Adam, how are you? Thank you. Ooh. Hold on. Let's see. Adam's around. Might just be on mute, but that's okay. We'll 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 onwards roll, and we'll. Uh, Great, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me along. I've got to remember. That's all right, Adam. No problems. So, um, thank you to all our panelists for joining us today. Thank you for everyone who's registered, who's joining us today too. Um, now, super quickly uh, before we launch into a couple of things, um, Leanne, some of us or some of our people with us today may know of the X Factor Collective and its work. Um, are you able to just provide a very quick little, uh, I guess, introduction or idea of, of uh, who the collective is? Yeah, sure, Chris. So the X Factor Collective was founded, we just had our third birthday uh, a couple of weeks ago, actually. And it's a group of specialist consultants and experts that support the uh, for purpose and social purpose sector, um, providing guidance and support and um, advice. And that could be anything from strategy to IT to fundraising, governance, people. We, we cover I think something like 40 specialty areas, if not more. Um, and the collective are there to support the social purpose sector with any needs that they have. But we also have a foundation arm, the X Factor Collective Foundation, which has a really strong focus on providing equitable access to charities, for charities, to information, and improving the, the well-being of people that work in the sector, um, and to address some of the systemic issues that have been ongoing in the, the for purpose sector for a long time. No worries. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Thanks for that. Um, now, before we launch in proper, as, as always, we've got a couple of quick housekeeping points, which I'll run through in a relatively rapid manner. Um, first up, if you've got any troubles with the audio for the webinar, you can try listening through your phone. Uh, if that's the case, you wish to do that, call the number that was listed in the email that you, have you will have received upon sign up and put in an access code uh, and, and listen to the webinar that way. Um, we are also doing questions a little bit differently today as well. Um, our colleagues, uh, Matt and, and Bree, uh, are going to be on board and they're answering questions about ACNC related topics. Uh, in addition, hopefully there'll be time near the end of the webinar today where we can discuss maybe one or two questions relating to some of the content that we'll cover today. However, for any detailed questions about 
some of the material that you'll hear about today about well-being, about charity people, the X Factor Collective has set up a dedicated email address. You can see the address for that email address on your screen right now. Where those of you today uh, or with us today uh, are encouraged to ask questions or seek out information most relevant to your particular charity or particular charity issue, those questions will be followed up uh, and responded to after this webinar. So um, feel free, there's the email address uh, for you. We're recording this webinar as always. The recording will be available to watch later on on the ACNC site. The presentation slides from the webinar will be published on the site as well. And we will send out an email with website links featured in this webinar so you don't have to write down all the website references as we go along. Finally, we value feedback. If you've got any suggestions for ways uh, we can improve our webinars, please let us know in the short survey at the end of proceedings today. Now, today's agenda. It's going to be split into three-ish sections. First up, we're going to quickly review some of the findings from the latest ACNC Charities Report. Uh, as well as look at uh, some AC, uh, the ACNC's governance standards and some of the important links that these things have um, to the well-being of, of people in the charity sector. Uh, we are going to look at the uh, reset research that the X Factor Collective Foundation undertook last year to measure some of the impacts the pandemic was having on charities and not-for-profits, uh, most particularly the challenges that the sector's people were facing. Um, the impacts of COVID were particularly in focus as part of this research. Uh, it provides plenty of information about how people are faring and, and their welfare. Our last and largest section is going to examine in detail how charities and their leaders can address these issues, uh, the tools and attitudes they can perhaps have to help these efforts and to improve resiliency and to, and to help their people. Um, the sector needs to ensure that those people in it are in a good space, they feel supported, and they can continue to contribute positively to their charities and through them to the community. There are so many things that can be done and um, our co-panelists here today are going to share their knowledge and, and their experiences. First up, a little bit of context uh, and a little bit of information on the charity sector, uh, its people and the importance of governance. And that comes through both the Charities Report and the ACNC Governance Standards. Um, now, the ACNC recently released the latest edition of the Australian Charities Report, which draws on information gathered in charities annual information statements. Uh, it provides context information on the size of the sector and the scope of the sector, particularly in regards to charity people and their involvement in charities and impact on them. Uh, the latest edition provides an insight into the state of the sector prior to both the 2019-20 uh, bushfires and also the COVID pandemic. Prior to the bushfires and pandemic, the sector was in robust health. Some of the key financial figures you can see here on the, on the screen, there was um, very healthy revenue growth in the sector, uh, growth in charity assets uh, up to $354 billion, um, and a $1.3 billion increase in donations uh, to bring the total in that, uh, that reporting period that year of uh, to $11.8 billion. Most importantly, and most rele relevant to our session today, the report also detailed the people side of, of the charity sector here in Australia. Um, charities employed 1.38 million people. Volunteer numbers were at 3.6 million, which in fact was a little bit of a drop uh, from the previous 12 months. Um, smaller charities, as is probably, uh, I guess, makes sense to a lot of us, more reliant on volunteers than larger ones. Larger ones drew on more paid staff than small charities. Extra small charities, which the ACNC defines as those with annual revenue less than $50,000, averaged 26 volunteers for every staff member. So the baseline is, this is where the sector stood particularly prior to the pandemic. It was in robust health, uh, and it, as always, played a big role in the, the Australian economy. Just as importantly, it again showed that charities involve so many people and make a positive difference to so many people. The sector is huge and varied and diverse, and its reach is wide ranging and its work is impactful. Now, charities impact is underscored by good governance and charities registered in Australia must meet the ACNC's governance standards. There are a set of six core minimum standards that deal with how a charity is run, 
that includes its processes, its activities, its relationships, overall its governance. There's a quick summary of the governance standards on, here, on screen here. Um, there's, as you can see, there's six of them. They cover a, a wide range of, of, uh, of things. For more detail, visit uh, acnc.gov.au forward slash governance standards. Uh, now, these standards are really the basics that form that important foundation for good charity governance. And there are many features of governance that flow on from this foundation that can help charity leaders manage wellbeing. A key part of good governance is good policy and good procedure. And these include good, as we call them, and I'll put the little air quotes around them, people policies and procedures. Policies covering the conduct and, ex conduct and expectations of people, um, as well as say, you know, clear HR processes. Good governance that helps people's well-being even stretches into things like you know, well-run meetings uh, with clear agendas and procedures, clear position descriptions for people, uh, great induction processes for new starters. These can provide clarity and guidance and confidence and direction for, uh, for charity people. Um, example of good governance, and when it comes to good governance, the example has to be set from the top though. Um, it has to be set from leaders. Good governance policy and even attitudes are driven by charity leaders. And because of this, well-being in many ways is driven by charity leaders as well. This is a theme that we will pick up in greater detail in a second. Um, before we do so though, we're gonna look quickly at the findings of the uh, X Factor Collective's Foundation's Reset 2020 research um, for a little bit of context on the impacts of, of COVID on charities and most particularly the well-being of their people. Um, now I'm gonna throw to Leanne here who is gonna guide us through the information in this section. Um, Leanne, uh, I'll, I'll let you go for it, thank you. Thanks, Chris. If you could just bring up the next slide, that would be great. There we yeah. go. So the Reset 2020 Research Project was a collaborative and collective effort, it was initiated and led by the X Factor Collective but supported and funded by equity trustees. And the research was conducted with the social purpose sector to understand the initial impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on organisations that provide support and assistance to their communities of interest. And we know that the good mental health and wellbeing of those who affect social change is critical to successful outcomes. So this survey served to better understand the wellbeing of those who work in the sector. The first survey took place in May 2020, with the second survey being run in at the end of September 2020 and into early October. And that was to look at the ongoing and emerging effects on the sector that was already facing significant challenges. So today I'll just be sharing a snapshot of the research findings with you, and we will be including a link to the full research report at the end of the webinar. And I'd really encourage you to go and have a look at that there's some really useful information that you could take back and use within your own organisations and get a, a broader sense of what's going on across the, the full social purpose sector. Thanks, Chris. So the key findings, if you're looking at this slide thinking, this sounds like us, be assured that you're not alone. Um, the key findings that came through really clearly from the respondents in the survey was that this pandemic that we're all still in continues to affect our service delivery. It remains an issue for a large majority of organisations, and I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know with that. Revenue has been affected and almost half of the respondents have needed to access reserve to, in order to continue their operations. We're seeing an increase in demand from their communities of interest, and that's making it harder to provide the levels of support required and the levels of support that organisations pride themselves on delivering. The second key finding that we um, saw was an increase in demand for the services that's led to staff leading longer hours. Higher workloads, continuing uncertainty of the pandemic are really having an impact on the mental health and wellbeing of staff and volunteers, leaving them less effective and prone to stress and anxiety. Um, and worryingly, respondents reporting burnout and fatigue. Those signs of workplace burnout have increased exponentially amongst respondents since the start of the pandemic. This really is of concern given how much the social sector contributes to the economy. And the fourth key finding was that organisations need help to diversify their revenue streams and support their staff and volunteer wellbeing. And while advocacy to government 
about their activities remains a really valuable support mechanism, many respondents indicated they would like and value some help to find new or diversify their existing forms of revenue and help to support their people. So the issue of wellbeing came up as a recurring theme in the research, as did the need for strategies and ideas to keep the workforces healthy and safe. Thanks, Chris. So the September 2020 interval of the research study found the following when it came to wellbeing impacts. 40 to 45% of the sector are now often or always in high levels of stress, exhaustion and overwhelm and not taking care of themselves. Um, that in itself is quite a worrying number, particularly when you compare it to pre-pandemic wellbeing indicators that showed nearly one in five were not taking good care of themselves, 16% felt their workload was unachievable and one in 10 were overwhelmed, exhausted and stressed. So we're already coming from a base um, of concern. The research also found that 69% of organisations rate the overall impact of the pandemic on their leadership team as negative and 48% rating that on their board as negative as well. So you can see that the, um, the impacts are far reaching. So with burnout and fatigue increasing among employees and volunteers in the social purpose sector, the research also uncovered a strong message about pre-existing systemic impacts on the, on the sector's mental health and wellbeing. An outstanding 80% of respondents stated that the existing or pre-pandemic ways of working are partly to blame, with existing sector constraints exacerbating those impacts on staff and volunteers. And overall, the, the research painted a picture of a workforce who finished 2020 working longer hours, 38% of them in fact, up from 17% in May, with 23% losing volunteers to illness or caring responsibilities, and less income. 58% had had a decline in revenue, even between the period of June and September. And as Chris showed us before, the number of volunteers that we have in charities in Australia is over double those of paid staff. So there's a significant impact on our volunteers as well. And with a sector that's got close to 50% of charities having no paid staff, the impact on our volunteers has been significant, with 75% reporting impacts on volunteer mental health and wellbeing as extremely or somewhat negative, with 46% reducing volunteer hours. So in summary, the study found that there are no significant differences in the impacts on the workforce based on the organisation's purpose, income or location, which suggests concerns about mental health of staff and volunteers is prevalent across the sector, regardless of the size. The research concluded that the most valuable forms of assistance that could be provided to the sector are continued advocacy, and help to manage the mental health and well-being of staff and volunteers. Uh, and that's something that we're going to address a little bit further today. Indeed. So let's take a look at some of the practical things we can be doing to support the wonderful people who give so much to the sector. Um, and Chris mentioned earlier that wellbeing is a leadership responsibility, uh, and it really is. Le leaders are, have a responsibility for the sustainability and wellbeing of their organisation and its people, so it can continue to serve the communities of interest. And with that comes putting strong foundations in place. So I'm a bit of a visual person, and I like to think of wellbeing as a bit like a house. So I thought I would share this image with you today. Um, and it starts with the foundations on the bottom and a roof on the top, like all good houses. If you've got foundations that are well constructed, they'll be able to take the weight of the load bearing pillars that hold up our people. And if the pillars and our people are supported and aligned, then leaders are in a much better position to ensure that the roof stays on. And that then allows them and the organisation to weather the storms and uncertainty that come along um, in situations including global pandemics. 
Perfect. But regardless of how big or small the organisation is, and I know we've got people from a, a real range of size organisations listening today, um, if the foundations are weak, then it, it does increase the risk that one or more of those vital three pillars could collapse. And that, as we've seen from the research, has pretty major impacts on our people and the beneficiaries. And I, each I and every part... Oh, sorry, sorry I was going to just, I was gonna just ask, with, the, with those three pillars there, um, these are things that perhaps leaders should be looking at um, in, as ways of, of, or as a guide point, I guess, to uh, influence uh, in a positive way uh, the wellbeing of their people, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of factors that contribute to the physical health, mental wellness and connection of the team. But we know that the work environment, whether that's paid or volunteering, is a really major one. Um, so while leaders can't directly influence every factor, they can influence the experience that somebody has while at work. Um, and they can do that through creating the foundations, and I'll talk a little bit more to that, but they can also do that through role modelling, um, positive promotion and creating culture of belonging, inclusion and equal access. No um, so we, of, I, was, I was going to say again, sorry, we, we mentioned um, policy and procedure and, and those sorts of things a few minutes ago. Um, how is there or where is their importance in this as well? Well, employers have a legal responsibility and a duty of care to ensure that a workplace is physically and psychologically safe for everyone. Mm. And focusing on wellbeing is not only a risk mitigation strategy, um, it's you know, we have that legal responsibility, but there's also an opportunity to shift it towards a place of shared humanity and responsibility. Um, so in addition to having the policies in place that are required by law, I think we should keep the conversation going beyond that and also consider proactive policies and practices that can support people in the way that they need most. Um, that might include things like looking at how you manage flexible working or support for remote workers and volunteers. Um, and Julia Keady, who's the founder and CEO of the X Factor Collective, used a term recently that I just love. It's called wellbeing governance. I think it's a really nice way of thinking about everything that we do and put in place that that is, it's good well-being, good governance to protect our people and the organisation. With um, with the focus on on uh, I guess of leaders on perhaps the well-being of of their people, um, is there a bit of a, an issue, or is there a bit of a risk that? leaders themselves can uh, put themselves in a place where they might not be looking after themselves? There is, there certainly is, and we see that a lot. And we even saw that in the research, uh, the Reset 2020 research, that 40 to 45 percent of respondents said they were not taking care of themselves. Uh, and if, if that's our leaders, and that really presents a significant risk for the sectors, but also for the organisations, and if leaders are not focusing on their own self-care, it makes it more challenging to be able to sustain um, what their organisation is delivering and support people as well. You know, leaders are, in our sector are faced with constant tasks of trying to do more with less. They've got funding uncertainty. There's the fatigue that comes with making all the decisions, scarcity of resources and supporting um, teams, big or small, so it's looking after yourself as a leader is, it's not a luxury, it's a real necessity, um, as is recognising signs in ourselves as leaders that things are not okay. Um, so there's um, certainly a point of recognising when it's time to create a healthy boundary between what you can control and what you can't. Yeah, and, and with that, and we might, we might um, link here to um, to Adam and, and some of the, the wisdom here that, that um, he's going to share. Um, what, what, are, what are some of these signs, Adam, that, that maybe things aren't quite right, um, that, um, yeah, they're, they're not quite as they should be? What perhaps should people be looking for in, in this context? Um, so, so you're really looking for any significant change in your people 
in terms of their mood, their motivation, um, their sense of humour, their sense of their sense of joy, um, where their attendance at work, their productivity. Mm -hmm. um, so any any really significant change. Um, the problem with that, Chris, is that most people are trying not to display how they're being affected. Yeah. Um, uh, the the kind of the requirement or the the obligation on the leader really is to be very active in um, looking for this um, because most people will soldier on um, and um, you know continue trying to do their job at their own expense. Yeah. Um, so if if we go down a, a couple of slides, there we go. Um, no, one one more below that to talk about oh, to the. To there we go. How's that? <laughs> um, the the little acronym that I use for this is what you're looking for is sad, mad, bad, and glad. Yeah. Um, now sad is 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 obvious. People are depressed. They're in low mood. They're not. Um, you know, they're, they're just not. Uh, they're not bright. Um, mad is is people getting irritable and angry and cranky and snappy at each other and just generally um, not pleasant to be around. Um, Bad is, and, and in the extreme, bad can be people, people becoming, you know, corrupt. But, but mostly it's people becoming cynical, um, cynical and detached. Just this, this sense of, um, yeah, well, why bother now? It's just too much. Mm -hmm. So my way of dealing with that is to detach, um, become cynical, become disengaged. Um, and the the one that um, that is probably the less recognised is, is glad and as you can see from the photo glad's this sort of sense of you know you know I'm so happy I'm about to kill someone with an axe <laughs> kind of very brittle overly happily overly positive um, presentation that's a pretty good indication that something's not right under the surface um, so all all of these are, are actually people's ways of of coping, um, they're, they're a way of, of minimising the impact on them. And, and what everybody's trying to get away from in this situation is this wonderful emotion we have that nobody likes particularly much called despair. Um, now despair is, um, as I said, not popular, but it's a very useful emotion. It's like our emotional red light. It's this emotion that says, you know what, it's time to stop. It's something you're doing is impacting you negatively. Um, and the emotional system says, well, I'm just going to take away your joy, I'm going to take away your motivation, I'm going to make you sit down, reflect, redirect, um, change course, um, change what you're doing. Um, but people resist it, they fight against it. So, and, and these are the ways they fight against it. Does that answer the question? It does indeed. Um, with, with these as they're, as they're here, the signs of trouble. Um, you, you mentioned some, I guess, some some quick ways that perhaps people can can recognise that maybe some team members uh, or even themselves might be might be having some issues. But how how then can leaders in particular look to support uh, those who they recognise might be um, might be having an issue or two. Okay, so can we jump back up one slide? We can indeed, yes, there we go. Um, it's very important that we distinguish, there, there are two sort of, they all end up at the same, all rivers end up at the sea, but um, there's two kind of pathways here. Um, there's a very big difference between what we call burnout, which is just, I'm exhausted, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I can't possibly meet the demands on me and maintain health and well-being and, you know, a positive attitude. It's just too much. Um, empathy fatigue and compassion fatigue um, are similar to that in that there's, a, there's an overwhelm of resources. So compassion fatigue is this, you know, there's only so much I can care about. There's only so much I can think about. Um, in, at, at one time, there's only so much... Um, attention and mental space I have for what's going on around me. Um, so it's sort of, it's an overwhelm of the cognitive system of the, of the mind. 
Um, empathy fatigues um, overwhelming the emotional system because most people who work in this sector are naturally empathic. We, when somebody tells us their story of pain and suffering and, and difficulty, we resonate with them emotionally. So we have an actual embodied experience of their um, or our own internalization of their feelings. Um, and that, that can only be sustained to a certain extent. If we're doing too much of that and too much of that is unpleasant feelings, is difficult feelings, and we're not sort of balancing that with joy and pleasant feelings and laughter and that, then we're just, we're just going to burn out emotionally. Yeah. Um, this is different from trauma. So, so trauma is, um, trauma is a, a, a disorder of self-evaluation. You know, if I come through a bad event and, you know, I feel like, say, Bruce Willis at the end of Die Hard, you know, I'm not traumatised by that. I'm, I'm empowered by that. Um, trauma is when I come through an event and I'm feeling like I'm defeated or I'm telling a negative story of I'm, I was worthless, I was useless, I was wrong, I was ineffective. Um, and the way this, this particularly affects helpers is because we are helpers. Um, and we don't like it when we fail to help. Um, so when you get too much demand and too little resources, people very quickly get to this point where they're feeling like they're not being effective. Um, and for some people that impacts on their identity, they start thinking that they're failing rather than the system is failing or the situation's just untenable. They start thinking that they're failing. So that's what we call vicarious trauma. Um, so it, it's not a it's not a resource problem. It's a psychological problem. It's it's important to be able to distinguish between those two. But the, in the end, they look the same. The person's behaviour in the end is that sad, mad, glad, or bad. Indeed. With, with these, with these, I guess um, these things that, that you've shared with us in these these couple of slides. What do you think? Uh, maybe a couple of the key things that the sector can do overall to to respond. What, I guess, responsibility um, do those in the sector have to maybe be upfront um, and recognise that there are that there are times that um, they they might not be just might not be feeling right or 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 that you know they they might need to recognise that you know, they're not 100% right. Um, what, what what responsibility do people in the sector have? And, and yeah, what what do you think the sector overall can, can do to respond, Adam? I, I, think, I think you named it, Chris, when you said it's got to be upfront. Um, okay. You know, once the signs are there, it's, it's too late. I mean, certainly recovery can happen, but um, it's getting to it before it happens. So that's not having a kind of reactive stand of, well, if this happens, I'll deal with it. It's having a creative position of not if this happens, but when this happens and is this happening? Because, you know, as we've seen from the research, it is happening. You know, this mm -hmm. is this is sector wide. Um, it's, it, it, you know, it's probably happening in your organisation right now. Um, so when it happens and to, um, as we'll talk about when we go to Joe, is talking about creating this culture that actually normalises this and destigmatises and says, this is not your failure that you're feeling this way. You know, this is this is simply a, a mathematical equation of demand Demand is over overriding resources. Or, um, and so it, it's this thing going, well, this is going to happen. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's put it into the conversation. Um, let's make it part of our everyday um, way of functioning. Um, you know, when I, I used to work in the construction industry and, you know, you stepped onto the job every morning, you had a toolbox meeting. You know, you sat down, you went, what's happening today? What, what are the risks we need to be aware of today? How is everybody going today? What does everybody need to know? And, and here's your job. So it's, it's really putting it up front. Don't start the day without checking in with people without um, actually getting in there and saying, if you are experiencing any of this, you need to come and talk. We need to have a conversation about that. It's not okay. You don't have to bury it. You don't have to hide it. You don't have to bear this burden alone. Um, so it's very much being on the front foot, have it part of the culture. With, with, with this, um, um, 
what we'll what we might do now we'll 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 perhaps bring Joe in on the conversation as well. We 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 mentioned or, or the mention uh, is made of the term uh, a culture of well-being, uh, upfront, um, yeah, a bit of honesty, de destigmatizing. Um, how can Joe a, a team um, create a, a culture of well-being? How how can they perhaps do that? Thanks, Chris. And I think, I mean, it's been a really insightful conversation listening to um, Adam and Leanne talk about this. And, and I think, you know, it, in terms of culture and how we can approach culture, I think a really good starting point is trying to understand um, what matters most to the people in our organisation. And that's whether the person or the people we're talking about are employees or volunteers or whether they're leaders or perhaps even whether they're a board member. Um, and if we think about the amount of people that we have in the sector, you know, some 5 million people from the, the early slides that you presented, that's, that's a lot to understand when we think about how do we better um, understand culture and how do we better create that, that culture of well-being. And I think, I know Adam touched on it before around having that conversation, that upfront strategy, but it's, it's really about making the time to have that important conversation about how our teams are working together, how our people are working together, what we value, how we engage. And if we think about this through the lens of um, well-being, we need to take a really deliberate approach to developing our culture around that. And I mean, Leanne showed us the data, you know, th th that data is telling us overwhelmingly that our people feel burnout, they've got high levels of anxiety, they're overwhelmed, they're fatigued. You know, and we've heard from Adam, you know, those signs to look for. And, and so that really brings us to this place around, you know, well-being putting our people at the centre of the culture that we want to nurture within our organisations. And we can really start to see how then wellbeing can become that boundary for cultural change and that boundary for creating culture um, within our respective organisations. All right, and, and I'll, what I'll do, I'll, I'll flip to the next slide for you, Joe. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, what what I, I guess, uh, you, are you presenting here with these with these three points? Um, what, what are you, what are your sort of key messages here? I guess. Yeah. So I mean, our culture in any organisation or any team, any group that we are part of, culture just doesn't happen by itself. We don't just turn up and here's our culture. Um, and it's something that we talk about a lot. Um, you know, and and you know, we see it across the sector. We often talk about culture. We acknowledge culture as being really important, creating a culture of well-being, but often we leave it to develop organically. Um, and what can happen there is we have a risk of creating an unintended culture. Um, now that can be good or bad, I guess, depending on um, what that culture turns out to be. But, but what we don't want, you know, Leanne mentioned before about the sector finishing last year, you know, with this extreme sense of burnout. We don't want how we describe culture to be burnout in the sector. We want culture to be about well-being um, and about you know sustainable organizations and that takes a really deliberate approach you know you can't build the foundation of that without taking that deliberate approach and it's something that really needs to be nurtured um, mm. particularly in times of change and and I often call that the unheroic work because we get really busy right and when it's you know all of our organizations are busy and and we're busier at the moment just given the the environment that we're in and you know whether an organisation is growing or consolidating or trying to figure out our way through this crisis that we're in, you know, we often forget to nurture the culture of the organisation that we have. Um, yeah. And it, it becomes that much more important when we're busy and our people need a lot from us and, you know, our, our stakeholders and our constituents, they need a lot from us as well. And, you know, it really is that, that role that we have to pay attention and, and to nurture that. And, and recognising that we're in this ongoing, you know, environment of, um, you know, constant readjustment, constant change, um, you know, things are always going to be different, whether that is because of, you know, a pandemic or because of increased need on our sector or because of consolidation. Um, and that means that we need to pay really close attention to culture. And it's, it's asking those questions. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's finding out what does matter most 
to the people within our organisation, regardless of what their role is, and really looking for how we can nurture that and grow that and develop that so that, so that we are really clear about, about what matters most for our people. Now, um, it's probably pretty clear here that, that culture um, isn't something that, say, happens by accident. Um, it, it, as, the, as your first point sort of says, sometimes, oftentimes it can be left to develop organically, but um, it, culture doesn't happen by accident though, does it? It needs a deliberate so, approach. It, it does need a deliberate approach and we have to bring it together. So, you know, it, culture in an organisation can't be a, you know, top down, the board or the leadership team says, you know, dear organisation, here's your culture. We can't gift it to the organisation. But equally, we don't want to kind of build it entirely bottom up because that's, you know, not, that doesn't always get us the right outcome either. So by understanding what matters most to the people within our organisations, asking that question, being curious, you know, about, you know, what are the things that we share as, as people and teams, um, you know, and, and what is the purpose that we're here to deliver? And kind of meeting in the middle almost, um, you know, is, is how we will really nurture that culture. We can't just leave it. We can't just wake up one day and go, something happened to our culture. Our culture is not good anymore. Our culture is burnout. We have to actually take the time to do that. And, and recognising that, you know, we have organisational constraints. And in our sector, we have a lot of constraints that, you know, that, that are there and present. And, you know, we kind of almost have to stop doing one thing so that we can actually just make that time and make that space to have that conversation. Because if we don't, we'll find ourselves down a path where we have an unintended culture, um, you know, which, which makes it much more difficult to, to try and change and get back on track later on. It really is doing that good work. Like Adam said, it's doing that work up front. Um, you know, as Leanne said, it's really putting those foundations in place so that every step forward um, becomes a, a, a positive step to really nurturing the culture and taking a really deliberate focus on that. I know that, um, and there's a, a couple of slides here which I might just progress through that that, um, that you have, Joe, that uh, mention uh, mention a couple of these things. Uh, there's there's one there, um, some feedback yeah. that we've and highlighted here. Absolutely, um, and we have these conversations in teams a lot, and and you know this really struck out to me. This you know this person said this to me recently. It's so easy to forget the value of a simple team conversation because yeah. we get busy, you know, and, and that's a constraint we have, you know, we get busy, but even just taking that, you know, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it's a Zoom cup of tea, it's whatever it is, to actually just sit and hear an experience of another person really helps bring to life what's valued about culture. Yeah, and I'll, I'll go to the next uh, next slide also that, that um, you, you provided for us, Joe, just um, as an additional one as well. Oh, and so true, right? You know, culture is what keeps us together when everything is going okay. Um, but the, the, the key bit here is it's the bit that holds us together when stuff gets a little bit tough. Um, and so we can't expect that to hold us together when things get tough if we haven't put the work in beforehand to really truly nurture and understand what it is that, that matters most in our organisations. And be the guardian of your culture. I, I do like that. I have to say, uh, that's, I that's love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, yeah. Now we and um, I'll I'll put this to to all of you here. We've we have received a a question through, and and thanks to to Matt and to Bree for for sending this one through to us just as a discussion before we wrap things wrap things up. Um, we've we've talked about a number of aspects in, in this area. And we, we've had um, a question come through um, and I'll, I'll, I'll read it, paraphrase it for you all. Um, how, how do you manage all of this when you are perhaps the person in charge and perhaps responsible for managing and looking after the wellbeing of staff when you are the one who might be struggling the most, or might be having um, might be having issues, um, is, there, is there some or all of you who would like to like to discuss that one? I'd love to jump in on that one. Go um, for it. 
I, I, I think this leadership's this fine line between um, being the person who is the container for the group, um, but also being vulnerable enough um, that we can allow the group to support us. Um, and, and I think sometimes leaders are afraid that if they show their vulnerability, then the group's going to lose faith in them or the group's going to lose, lose confidence or lose trust. Um, I would say it's exactly the opposite. It, it's, it's our ability as leaders to be vulnerable, to um, expose our own belly and, and say, you know what, I'm actually struggling right now. Um, and as an opportunity for other members of the group to join in and say, yeah, well, actually, that's my experience too, which is what Joe and Leanne have been talking about. Um, but also as a way to um, to get the support they need um, from other members of the group. All right. Joe, Leanne, do you have anything further on that one? Oh, I was just going to, I'm wildly nodding my head here um, that nobody can <laughs> see um, to, to, to Adam's comment because, you know, Managing it all, I mean, leadership role in any organisation is a hard gig and in our sector it, 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 it can often be a lonely gig as well. Um, and, you know, when, when we think about culture, culture is a collective team effort. One person doesn't create the culture, it's all of us together. And so, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with, you know, with, with what Adam said, it's, it's, it's how do we do this together? How do we navigate through this together as a team, as a culture, you know, and to, to take that forward? Yeah. We do have another one, and um, thank you for thank you to all three of you for um, being willing to share your knowledge on these ones that are coming coming through. Um, we often, um, in in all walks of life, hear about um, you know employee assistance programs, support, uh, EAP, those, those sorts of things. Um, telling telling staff about this type of support, you know, if they need to talk. That, that sort of thing. Um, question is, is, is this, do you believe, sufficient and sustainable in looking after our people? I'm happy to jump in on this one, Chris. Go I think the EA, sorry, I think EAP is a part of the solution. It's not always the whole solution. People have very different experiences with uh, people that they talk to in EAP lines and when I think about how to best support people, I think it's a sum of all the parts. You know, the EAP is one of those resources that is amazing to have available for people to tap into, but it's also that having a culture where they might be able to share things with their peers, talk about it openly, um, having policies and practices in place that might support um, the need for a mental health day or recognising that juggling kids, juggling multiple demands might mean I need to work different hours that day um, or need to work the same hours but over split split times of the day. So hmm. looking at how to support people in multiple ways, taking a real multiple prong approach to their wellbeing will always be a better outcome and a more a longer, more sustainable outcome than just relying on one um, resource in itself. No problem. And I'd, I'd like to I'd like to jump in and reinforce what Leanne's saying in that unfortunately we know that only two to four percent of employees ever use the AP service. Um, there are some barriers to using the service that we don't have time to go into, but um, what we know from the research is that most of this will occur through peer debriefing and peer support. Most of these issues we be, will be dealt with within the, within the group. Mm. So uh, the, the, best, the best way to handle that is to resource the group properly for that to occur, is what I would suggest. No problems. We, we have, um, and thank you to, to all of you for your input on those two questions. It's, that's wonderful. Um, we have, as you can see on our screen, we're going to, um, work through uh, some some tips that that each of uh, our, our sort of co-presenters today have have sent our way um leanne I'll maybe start with uh, i think you had three tips that you were going to 
uh, sort of speak to, and I'll, I'll work through some of these slides, and if you wanted to speak to them, um, go for it. Yeah, thanks, Chris. And it talks to the first question that we, we just addressed um, a few minutes ago, that it really is important for leaders to prioritise their own well-being. So that analogy of fitting your own oxygen mask so that you can support others, it's never been more vital than it is right now. Um, and that could be asking for help, it could be asking for support, it might just be letting your team know loudly and proudly that you are taking the next half hour um, off to go for a walk outside. So you know, you're, you're looking after your own wellbeing and you're role modelling that for your team. Um, the second one is building those strong foundations that support the wellbeing of all of your people. And it's a little bit of what I just talked to in that second question around EAP is not the sole solution. So look at everything that makes up the foundations of your culture, your policies, your practices, your communication, everything that contributes to those pillars. Um, to to give a better outcome. And I think I had one more on the next slide as well. Thanks, Chris. Did indeed, Leanne, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the third one was creating healthy boundaries between what you can control and what you can't. Um, as leaders of the organisation, there are a lot of things that will be out of your control um, and you don't have to be the keeper of everything. Now, um, Adam, I know that you had a couple of takeaways too. One of them we've uh, got a bit of a preview for uh, right here with the number four next to it. Um, did you want to just sort of take us through the couple of things that you wanted to mention? Yeah, it's, it's I mean, I'm, I'm probably just repeating myself. It's, it's not if, but when. This is going to happen and it probably already is happening. Um, so, just just be alert to it, you know. Don't 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 wait till it you know has to kind of hit you over the head with a baseball bat to um, get your attention. Um, and do what you can to limit exposure to distress. I know that the the demands on services right now are huge, um, but we don't actually if we sacrifice ourselves to meet those demands, we don't actually help people. We we kind of end up losing staff and we end up losing productivity um, so it's it's really got to be about limiting people's exposure to distress and to counter that also building fun you know make the workplace fun make the workplace celebratory make the workplace something that yeah. um, is really people want to turn up for and Joe you had um uh, three things that, that you wish to highlight. And again, one of them, we're getting a bit of a preview <laughs> of here on uh, next to point six. That's uh, right. What were the three things you wish to highlight? I think, I think that one fits quite well with, um, with Adam's point above it, doesn't it? You know, creating that positive culture. But to do that, you've got to kind of make the space for that. So, um, you know, I always, you know, suggest we stop doing one thing um, to make that space so that we can actually, um, you know, create that create that culture and ask those questions. Um, it's also about having the conversation as well. So, you know, being curious, asking the, asking your people, what matters most to us? How do we work together? Um, and really creating that shared understanding of not just each other, but of, of the culture of, of the organisation as well. Yeah. Now we, um, and I'm, I'm wary of the time here, we've got about five or six minutes here. We've broached a couple of questions. Thank you to those who've, who've sent them through. and. Um, as I wrap up in a second, I'll also um, repeat some of the, the other options that you've got to further the conversation. Um, but we did have one more question come through that um, we'll share here. And, and it's probably something that, that many people are feeling, not just within the sector, but perhaps overall. Um, and it's this issue of um, loss of contact, it may be family contact, uh, and, and perhaps workplace contact um, due to lockdowns that are occurring right now. Um, it, it can lead a little bit to that feeling of, of um, just despondency uh, and those sorts of things. How as leaders can perhaps those in, in the sector uh, address this or, or at least broach it as, a, as an issue? Uh, 
I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in there a bit, Chris. I, I think I think we sort of we, we spoke a little bit about it before around this, um, you know, sort of shared responsibility because a lot falls to leaders and and you know the the leader can feel responsible for keeping everybody connected and and we get busy and and you know when we're all working in isolation it's hard to tell if the person that normally sits next to me in the office is you know flat out busy or I can actually can I pick up the phone and call them or can I drop a zoom coffee into their diary and I think it's mm. that you know for me it, it is it's part of this deliberateness um, you know that I spoke about earlier but it's really making those deliberate steps to keep people connected. This is not an easy thing to do. We're all human beings and we need to be with other human beings, you know, um, through the course of our, our, our working and our, our, our lives. Um, but in this, you know, weirdness, making that deliberate step to have that it's morning tea Monday or it's Thursday afternoon coffee or, you know, if it's a, an end of week BYO drink, I don't know, I went to a fancy hat thing recently, you know, it's, it, some of that stuff feels a little bit kitschy and a little bit sort of, you know, strange and weird, but it's the thing that's going to hold us together at the moment because if we can't be physically connected to people, we have to find another way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. What we might do now, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll say thank you for, um, to all three of you for, um, for broaching these questions and providing some responses and thanks to those who have who have sent some of these questions through. Um, we're near the end of our allotted hour, I suppose, um, and near the end of our, our formal presentation. Uh, again, just a reminder that, that um, a recording of this webinar and the slides are going to be available on the ACNC website in the coming days. Um, and we will be sending a follow-up email out to everyone who registered. Um, for this webinar with um, some links and some uh, bits and pieces uh, for you to have. Um, again, for more detailed questions or assistance um, for charities in relation to some of the things that have been mentioned in this webinar, um, the X Factor Collective has an email address. Again, that's askxfactor at xfactorcollective.com. Um, feel free to send uh, a question or a query through and they will be followed up um, and, and responded to. The Chris, could you mind just sharing oh, the sorry. slide with the details? Okay. I, I, I can, it's gonna be right back at the start. So we're gonna do a quick, actually, hold on. What I might do is I might go forward. There we go. There's the email there. Um, so that's, that's the email um, right there. So if you feel the need to get in touch, please do so. The other thing I was gonna mention and we will share this link through the follow-up email that we are going to be sending out to everyone after uh, after this webinar is that the the x factor collective have also set up times during august and september where anyone who's attended registered for today's webinar can book in to uh, what they they have called their concierge service and that's aimed at helping organizations who want to find resources or support or speak with them about their needs in a confidential way. Now, we won't share that um, uh, that web address here. To those who've registered for this uh, webinar, that will be coming out in our follow-up email. So you'll, you'll have that in place. And if you wish to access that service, or if you wish to find out a little bit more, um, feel free to do so. Um, beyond that, these are some of our, our links, um, both to the ACNC and to the X Factor Collective. Um, Again, there's a link to the Reset 2020 um, research as well, uh, to websites um, and, and all of that sort of stuff. So um, we've pretty much reached the end of our hour. <laughs> so thank you to everyone who has attended today. Um, thank you hugely to Leanne and to Joe and to Adam. Um, thank you all. Uh, for sharing your insights and, and your your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's welcome. No um, and thank you also to Matt and to Bree who have been busily um, handling everything behind the scenes and communicating some of your questions through. Um, it's hugely appreciated, so thank you for that. Uh, and lastly, thank you to everyone who's uh, turned up and attended and uh, tuned in today. We hope that 
uh, what has been covered will offer some assistance to your organisation, to your leaders uh, and to your, your people. So we look forward to catching up with you all again in the near future. Uh, until we do, have a great day, uh, stay safe and thank you very much. Goodbye.